welcome back everybody to another wonderful episode of the nonprofit show we're really excited to have you here i think i'm more excited about our guest today than anything else we have mitch stein who's one of our intrepid co-hosts but we put him in the hot seat we're going to be talking about dafs donor advised funds and their donors but most importantly welcome back to the nonprofit show mitch stein so good to be back and excited to be on the other side as a guest. <laughs> well, you know, Mitch, um, I'm all about information. We were talking in the green room about sharing knowledge, sharing research, which is expensive to cultivate and track and articulate. And you did something really interesting. And we're going to be talking about that with this groundbreaking report. I also want to get your feedback on what has happened aside from the knowledge and aside from the ecosystem of this topic. Some interesting things have happened to you. And dare I say, you know, the nonprofit sector when they've been had when they've had access to this information. So Mitch Stein, head of strategy at Chariot. Um, we're excited to have this conversation. We're also very excited to really thank and and illuminate our sponsors bloomerang american nonprofit academy staffing boutique nonprofit thought leader your part-time controller fundraisers friday and 180 management group the man of the hour mitch stein one of our co-hosts but again as i said mitch is going to be in the hot seat today as we really explore what's cooking with this amazing research as head of cherry as head of strategy for chariot what in the heck is it that you do and what is chariot <laughs> well thank you so much for having me julia and having me on this side of the table um so yeah as actually mentioned i'm the head of strategy at chariot we're the donor advised fund payments company um so our focus is helping nonprofits get more donor advised fund donations and get more information about donors that make gifts that way um, we have a tool called daf pay it sits right on your donation form or your website, just like PayPal or Venmo as another payment option where a donor can use their donor advised fund at checkout when they're donating online at the moment they're inspired to give. That could be on your website in response to an email as part of a peer to peer campaign or a specific giving day. Um, they don't need to go leave, log into their portal and make that more disconnected gift that you won't know about for several weeks. It's all connected right there in your standard fundraising flows. This is so exciting and so full of innovation. Um, it blows my mind because um, DAFs are some, they've, it's kind of like bubbling to the surface. It's not a new concept, but I feel like maybe the concept is becoming more understood or more popular. I shouldn't even say understood because I don't think it's understood, but more <laughs> available and, and more people are using it. Before we get into your research, could you talk to us a little bit about how this behaves and what this tool is? Yeah. So I always like to start with a simple explanation of what a DAF is, because I think yeah. even people who have heard it before, mm -hmm. uh, they always appreciate a refresher. Um, but <laughs> I think the easiest way to think about a donor advised fund is it's very similar to a 401k for retirement or like an HSA, a health savings account um, for healthcare costs, where there's a specific vehicle set up that you can put money aside into in a tax advantaged way and keep the amount in the account invested in the market. So it's growing over time and then use it for a specific purpose for a 401k that's retirement, for HSA that's healthcare costs, for a DAF that's charitable giving. So when you contribute into a donor advised fund, that could be in the form of just cash, but a lot of people also put in like appreciated assets. So shares of stock or mutual funds or bonds, things from their investment portfolio, they can contribute that into a donor advised fund. They get the tax write off immediately on the full amount. They avoid any of that tax um, that they would owe a capital gains tax. And then it also grows tax free in the account. And all of that money has to go to charity. It's the only thing you can use it for once it's in the account. And then people can kind of centralize all their giving in that one place, not worrying about organizing tax receipts or any of the rest. Right. It's so smart. You know, before we get into the study, can you, and I, again, this is like for everybody watching this, um, 
we don't see the questions or do a lot of prep work. So this is a genuine conversation. Can you give us some ideas about how many DAFs are out there and maybe like what the demographics of a DAF holder might look like? Yeah. And that's this, uh, honestly, how we start off the report is to kind of level set with that information. Okay. Um, and also how this has changed over 10 years, because mm -hmm. the number of DAF accounts and the amount of assets and the amount of giving has close to 10 X over the past 10 years. So now there's over 3 million people that use donor advised funds for their giving. Um, I think historically people thought about this like a, just a tool for the ultra wealthy. And yeah. that has really drastically shifted um, as more of these providers of donor advised funds, like especially the big ones, like Fidelity and Schwab, they got rid of their account minimum requirements. The costs went way down. The minimum gift size came down to $50. So now people are able to use this as a core charitable wallet for a more everyday donor who just wants to be more intentional with their giving um, or a little smarter with their, their taxes and finances around their giving. So it's not just the tech bros in Silicon Valley or the Wall Street dudes, I should say, and do deaths <laughs> in, in Manhattan. It's really moving across to school teachers and business owners or whatever um, throughout our country, right? I mean, it's not so geographically centered. Is that is that fair to say? Yeah, very fair to say. And also the age demographic is coming down. Definitely the fastest growing age demographic is below 40. Um, the average user of a DAF does tend to be a little bit older. And that also depends upon which DAF you're talking about. There's over a thousand providers of this tool. So that includes, like I mentioned, Fidelity and Schwab, like these big financial brokerage firms sure. um, where people will just kind of create a DAF alongside their other investment accounts, but also mm -hmm. community foundations offer DAFs, like religiously affiliated groups offer DAFs. Yeah. Um, and then there's like newer kind of like tech forward providers, like a company called Daffy that has a mobile app for you to manage everything or a company called Charity Vest. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of new entrants in the market. And there's even folks that specialize in DAFs for employees, where it's an employee benefit that your employer can match your contributions into your DAF, similar to a 401k. Mm -hmm. I love this. Well, let's get into this a little bit more strategically. Um, I'm fascinated that you all took this time um, we're very, very strategic. I mean, you are the head of strategy, so <laughs> this makes sense. I would expect nothing less from the amazing Mitch Stein, but um, talk to us about this like super, I would say hyper sensitive changing environment. And then you all decide to study it. Talk about your, your mechanism for conducting this study and why you decided to do it. Yeah, it really was because there was such a gap in information available to us mm -hmm. and to nonprofits. So the, the stats I referenced earlier, those are all based on data that is disclosed by the donor advised funds themselves. So super helpful and useful, but it's not the entire story. Uh, we didn't have any information on the nonprofit experience related to this growth in DAFs. Like, are they seeing the same thing? Are the gifts actually arriving to the nonprofits that we're familiar with, these operating organizations? Um, how does the gifts differ from what they see from other donors? How does an individual donor change their behavior once they start using a DAF? All of that was completely opaque to an organization um, because they were limited to what they knew in-house. And for many folks, they didn't even know that because they hadn't done the work to um, clean the data in a way that could be analyzed to find this information. So it was really to fill to fill the gap. And there was a big demand once we put the idea out there, as you can see from who it ultimately ended up participating. Mm -hmm. It's riveting. And we'll talk about this at the end. But um, this is something that you can go on uh, to givechariot.com and download and read through. I mean, for me, looking at the information, Mitch, I feel like it's a snapshot of where the donor ethos and intellectual strategy, if you will, is going in our country. I, 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 I expected it to be a very specific slice about this tool called a donor advised fund. And I don't know what you're hearing, but I felt, and correct me if, if you think I'm wrong, I felt it was kind of like something that we need to know because it umbrellaed 
our, our giving society, our, the society of, of Americans who are giving. I completely agree. And I think anyone in the nonprofit fundraising world knows that this is a tough environment to be fundraising in. I mean, we keep seeing these annual stats about flat, even declining like overall growth and giving from individuals. And I think a lot of us are like, something needs to change. Like, we need to do something to better engage people around their giving. Um, and what can do that? And what do we have real proof that changes how people engage and give? And so to your point, the insights that we now have from this data set is really phenomenal about how DAFs are a tool that does just that. It's a source of um, extremely fast growth in revenue for nonprofits. It's more sustainable and enduring. Uh, and the donors that adopt this tool end up giving more. Fascinating. It, it's it's really, I, I can't say enough about it. Aside from Chariot and the, the thought leadership that you all give, um, it uh, to me, it's really um, just one of those things that, that everybody needs to be looking at and starting to think about, because this is really something that's that's shockingly rapid in its increased popularity. Talk to me about what some of those key drivers look like. You mentioned a younger demographic, which I would argue is more comfortable and more resourceful when it comes to a digital framework for managing their life, right? Yeah, kind of absolutely. Yeah, I, and I think just to, to frame the question a bit around increased popularity within the study, we looked at five years of historical giving data between 2019 and 2023. And we were able to compare what these 20 organizations, which 20 might not sound like a lot, but many of them are some of the largest in the country. So wow. it included 78 million transactions and almost $11 mm. billion in total revenue that we analyzed. Um, mm. And within that, we were looking at non-DAF revenue. So individual giving that's coming through other channels and DAF revenue. And what we saw was that over the whole group, the median increase in non-DAF giving between 2019 and 2023 was 1%, meaning it was Ooh. basically flat. The median increase in DAF revenue was 214%. So for every single organization that participated, they're seeing higher growth in DAF revenue than non-DAF revenue. And the median is over 200% growth over that five-year period. So it is rapidly expanding in terms of dollar value and number of donors that are using it. And also the average um, percentage of revenue that DAFs make up within the group was 12%. So, and that's up from 6% five years ago. So it is just becoming this really like meaningful and, and I'd say core revenue stream for people. The drivers of that popularity, I think, stem from some of the stuff we talked about earlier. I think people are familiar with the tax advantages and that might be the first thing that they point out. But I think what might not be as obvious is just how helpful it is for managing your philanthropy and meeting goals, right? People who really are invested in their giving, um, they they want to give more. They, they have intentionality, but yeah. it's hard to follow through on those goals when you're trying to get there just by making one-off gifts whenever you're approached. When you're right. proactive and you say like, actually, I'm going to set aside a certain percentage of my income every month or quarter and put it into a DAF and manage my giving from there, it has a tremendous psychological impact. You know, every time that we are approached okay. about giving, we are making two decisions at the same time. One is a budgeting decision. How much money can I part with at this moment in time and spend on this instead of my dinner later? Mm -hmm. um, the other is an allocation decision. How much money do I want to give to a specific organization? When you take away the budgeting decision, meaning like I've already set all this money aside and now it's almost like I have a gift card that I get to just allocate. People are isolating the joyful feeling of giving instead of the stressful feeling of budgeting. And it just ends up making people so much more generous and so much more apt to give when they're approached. Wow, that's like to me a hair and fire moment comment because I had never thought of it that way, right? Um, and I, I think that it's it's fascinating because it's got to make this less emotional, more dependent upon 
impact in the relationship that that donor is going to have longer term with the nonprofit. I mean, do you think that's fair to say? Yeah, and that was another thing we found in the report was that um, the likelihood of retaining that donor once yeah. they're using their DAF is much higher. On average, 15 percentage points higher uh, year over year retention for DAF donors. And I think it's to that exact point where people are, these are intentional givers. Yeah. They're invested in their giving. They view their giving as a form of investing. Right, because they've this is an investment account, but specific mm -hmm. for their philanthropy, and yeah. so I think because of that, it's natural that once someone's supporting you from their DAF, they're much more likely to repeat it. It's also very easy to repeat a gift in the future, looking sure. back at your historical transactions. Yeah, um, and and I just think again, they're they've isolated this really positive feeling, um, and they're having fun. Like I, I think whenever you talk to someone who use, I use a DAF. Um, I automatically put a hundred dollars a month in there. It gets matched a hundred dollars a month by my employer. And so whenever I get asked about someone's birthday fundraiser or a run that they're doing, it's fun. I'm like excited to go allocate this and I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not as stressed because I've already set it aside and it's not right. like an incremental budgeting decision. Yeah. I love that. And I think that's, uh, you know, I know that you and I have talked about that privately before about how in your own life, it is, it's an automatic, you know, withdrawal, your, your employer matches it. What a great um, employee retention incentive, um, a really marvelous way to, you know, carry that thread through. And, and, uh, and I, I love that you gave that, that example. Now let's get to the dark side of where this is all going, because there's a lot of chitter chatter about what the future is and the implications, which I, I love where you're going with this, but let's step back and, and say, take a look at, at your information about, you know, is the government, specifically the IRS, who's really managing the, the, some of these vehicles um, in terms of how they can function, do you see changes coming down the pike? Because with this explosive growth, it seems to me like sometimes we see these things and then all of a sudden there's a new level of oversight that comes. And I'm just curious what you all think, given this research. Yeah, I mean, I wish I had a, a crystal ball. These are things that no one, no one can, can uh, specifically predict. I did get to go to the IRS hearings in May uh, when they yeah. invited public testimony um, uh, in response to some updated definitions they put out on their DAF regulations. Um, there was over seven and a half hours of testimony that I listened to, so I definitely feel uh, up to speed <laughs> on yeah, the topic. Good. Good. I think I think the main takeaway from most people that were there and I spoke to afterwards was just like nothing is going to come from this soon. Um, there's a lot of discussion to work through and it's been evolving so rapidly that I think it's tough yeah. for regulators to keep up with that because their process is so long. Um, so that being said, I do think there's a, there's certainly a lot of focus on, on the topic, both from regulators like the IRS, but also from legislative bodies like Congress. Mm -hmm. You know, there was some legislation that was reviewed called the ACE Act, the Accelerating Charitable, Charitable Expenditures Act. I think they always come up with these creative acronyms um, but that moved through or came to Congress in 2021. And I don't even think it made it to the floor for a vote. Um, but I feel like the topic is getting some more attention um, from people. So I think that could be something that comes up in 2025. Mm -hmm. um, but I think whatever happens from like a legislative or regulatory front, I, I just don't think the topic of DAFs it's nothing is going to make them really go anywhere because I I think that yeah. the goal from the regulators and even some of the critics perspective is like, but there are there are some accounts that maybe aren't dispersing this money fast enough. You know, the overall average at um, at the national level is over 20 percent per year of the total assets gets dispersed in grants. And it's been over 20 percent since they started tracking it in 2009. But that's not to say that there might be certain accounts that aren't dis uh, dispersing funds as quickly. And so sure. I think that's where some of the focus is. And mm -hmm. I mean, our perspective is just we want to make sure what, whatever the changes are, that it's ultimately benefiting nonprofits. 
because we certainly don't want to see something where we make the vehicle difficult to use or confusing. And, yeah. and when it's the, what we see in this research, it is the primary source of growth and sustainable revenue for these nonprofits. I mean, half right. of the organizations that participated saw a decline in non-DAF revenue over that five-year period. And a third of those actually saw enough growth in DAF giving that they're still growing overall. It made up for the losses that they're seeing on the non-DAF side. So I think most nonprofit fundraisers would agree they're keeping a close eye on the regulation, both because yes, they wanna see these the assets set aside for giving to be used um, and used quickly, but they also want to make sure that the the baby isn't getting thrown out with the bathwater, so to speak, where yeah. this is a a key vehicle of support um, that's proven to really increase giving for individuals. Well, and we talk about this, Mitch, all the time. I mean, even on the nonprofit show, day in, day out, we use the word relationship, you know, getting to that place where your donors are and understanding what makes sense for your donors, not just for your own organization. And so when we can walk, you know, that line with our donors and understand um, how they're thinking, how they're managing their investments, I think it's brilliant. And it, it's, it's so fascinating to me, Mitch, that um, it seems to me that those nonprofits that are gonna stretch, that are gonna innovate, they're going to embrace some change and some new things, are going to be the true winners. Yeah, and and I think that that is the single most compelling takeaway from the study, as I've talked about it with more and more organizations, is we were able to see from a specific organization's perspective, when they have a donor that currently, say in 2021, gave to them with a credit card, say they donated $500. Mm -hmm. In 2022, that exact same donor, if they started using a DAF in the next year to support the same organization, the average increase in their annual support was 96%, meaning they would give $1,000 in the next year. And, and that unlock for people, to, and there were over 16,000 instances of that across the participating organizations. Mm -hmm. And the median was close. It was like 78% growth. So just across the board, the conversion of someone from not using ADAF to using ADAF and the impact on the organizations they already support was mm -hmm. doubling their giving. So I think that really helped many nonprofits get their arms around the fact that this isn't something to be scared of raising or talking about with your donors. You actually want to proactively bring this up. You want to put it front and center, both because someone opening a DAF, I think there historically was like, oh, is that going to take money away from us if they start using a DAF and they deploy some capital there? But that's just not how things work in practice. It just creates a more intentional, engaged and larger giver. And, and I think even promote by promoting DAFs and DAF giving, the people who aren't yet using their DAF but already have one are reminded and more likely to use it. Right, because it becomes a structured uh, process of, of engaging in your own personal philanthropy. And I, I think you made the comment when we first got started. It's efficient, it's tracked, it's in one place, everything's, you know, the, these reports that are probably generated, depending on who you're using or where you've, where you've housed your DAF. Super interesting. I, I, I could spend so much more time with you. And unfortunately, our time is almost up. I want to talk about the DAF Day of Giving, October 10th. Give us an idea on what this looks like and, and what the impetus is for this. Yeah, so glad we could could chat about it. This is the first ever giving day dedicated to donor advice funds taking place on 1010 on October 10th. Um, every nonprofit is welcome to join and utilize this day to engage with their existing DAF donors and also reach out to a broader base of donors to see if they use the DAF or interested in learning more um, and also encourage them to all join together in giving on the same day. Giving days work, they're super yes. motivating. Um, yeah. And it's great to have a shared framework that not just your organization put out there, but is something that's happening across the sector. Mm -hmm. um, we announced this in July, along with 60 partners that included many of the largest nonprofits in the country, American Heart Association, International Rescue Committee, the ACLU, et cetera, um, and seen even more organizations, hundreds more joined since we started. Um, so you can join the movement at daftday.com. 
completely free again. That's just like open for folks to engage and leverage this day for your fundraising. When you sign up, you'll receive a full marketing toolkit that includes templates for emails you can send, social media posts, um, visual assets, logos, everything. Uh, there's also a private LinkedIn group where participating fundraisers are sharing ideas and using it as a forum to kind of talk about their different campaigns. And we have a full webinar series, uh, educational webinars talking about different DAF topics and uh, helping people set up their campaigns for DAF Day um, over the next few weeks. Great. Well, I am going to go on to the nonprofit show uh, booking system that we have where we book our guests. And I might be bumping whoever is already scheduled for October and, and <laughs> pivoting for this because I think this is a really cool thing. And and I would love for us to get involved in that because I just think it's um, it really is to your point, Mitch, in that you so brilliantly laid out for us that this is the future of where we can go and see growth. You are right. We have not been getting good information about where philanthropy is going in America. And while we, we hear about these super donors and we think, oh my gosh, all this money's flowing, the core group and, the, and the, the main artery to giving from our population is stagnant. So how do we look at this? How do we get to where donors are? And so super important information. Um, before we let you go, I want for you to share with everybody, Mitch, how we can get this information and how we can get this study. Yeah, so study is uh, totally free as well. You can download that on the give uh, the website, givecherry.com. Um, under resources, you can click right there uh, okay. to see the see the summary. There's there's an executive summary, and then you can download yeah. the full report. It's 57 pages, and we go very uh, in depth both on the data and uh, best practices for data keeping around DAFs, as well as strategies to actually execute on um, for your marketing and fundraising efforts. So tons of amazing resources in there to leverage. And then on DAFDay.com, you can see all the information about DAF Day, sign up and get involved. You'll see all the upcoming events and webinars that are also free for everyone to join. Awesome. You know, I, I don't want to leave without really um, looping back to the amazing partnership that you had with these nonprofits that allowed you to get this incredible amount of information. Um, the transparency and the, the honesty with which these folks handed over information is riveting. I have just riveting. Been, on both of these fronts have been blown away. Like the, yeah. the willingness to collaborate and share. Yeah. I mean, obviously we, weren't disclosing anything specific to any one organization or to any other participants, but still it was a lot of work to create this data and share it with us and get all the approvals internally and answer our questions and kind of go through some back and forth. And then similarly on DAF Day, I mean, just seeing this level of collaboration where people were willing to take a risk and join us in announcing and putting their name on a brand new event and brand new day, but that depth of participation and collaboration is what is making it a you know big thing even in its very first year so we are just so grateful for all the nonprofits that have partnered with us yeah it's really exciting well bravo to you i think you're just such an amazing thought leader we're excited to have you in our family of of great leaders across our country talking about the things that can make our nonprofits more successful and sustainable and so this has really been a joy to learn more about. You know, I think it's just going to escalate. So I can't wait to, tr to track this and see what everybody's saying and what the experience is and, and how it's growing because it's just we're at the start of it. And, um, you know, to your point of DAF Day, the more folks know about it and then the more data we start to analyze and understand really what the implications are, Katie, bar the door, right? I mean, yeah. it's it's not going to just be the the institutional size nonprofits engaging in this. It's going to be smaller groups, you know. And that was a priority of DAF Day, right? It's and this comes up almost every person I talk to is like, "How much does it cost? Like, yeah. what do we have to buy?" I'm like, "Nothing. This is a shared event. It's just like similar to Giving Tuesday. You can jump on and use it in the ways that you want to for your organization. So, highly encourage everyone to leverage all those shared resources." 
Good. Well, I'm going to make a public, you know, commitment to you and Daft Day that, that the nonprofit show will get involved because it's it's a really an interesting thing. And, and when you look at the opportunity that's out there, we need to be exploring these things and not just, you know, sitting on our hands, hoping that something changes in the nonprofit yeah. sector. We got to lean into change and innovation and take a risk. And um, I think it's really exciting. Mitch Stein, head of strategy for Chariot. You can learn more about Mitch and the amazing work and innovation that Chariot navigates day in and day out with our nonprofits across this country at givechariot.com. Learn more about what's on the, the horizon and definitely, definitely download that study. It is riveting and it might just help you to make some forward plans that you hadn't even considered. Um, another thing that we want to make sure that we do is to talk about the consideration that we get each and every day from our amazing sponsors. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Fundraisers Friday, our new Friday episode, which is so much fun, just dedicated to fundraising, and then 180 Management Group. These are the folks that join us day in and day out. Hey, Mitch Stein, you are amazing, my friend. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate you, Julia. Thank you for having me. It's been a lot of fun. Hey, each and every episode, we end with this message, and it goes like this. To stay well so you can do well. Thanks, everyone.